Welcome to this introductory series of training videos for SOLIDCAM. This video's topic is the HSM operation. So the HSM operation is a solid-based finishing toolpath. Uh, and what we mean by that is basically the geometry for this toolpath, for this operation, will be a solid. Uh, generally, you will default to the target model because that is one solid that you already have defined in your part file. And if you always reference the target in every one of your 3D toolpaths, you have one solid that you can manipulate that will update all your toolpaths. Uh, so it's always a good idea to use the uh, default unless you're doing something specific with your part. Uh, HSM has many different options in it. So in this video, we'll cover the basics of HSM, and then we'll go through each one of those options in terms of the basic uh, terms of how that works. Uh, so let's start by finding where we can get the um, HSM. So solid cam operations tab, you can see that there's a HSM option there or SolidCam 3D, there's an HSM tab there. And like I was mentioning before, there are many different options in the HSM. So in this video, we'll start with the basics of HSM, and then we can go through each one of those options there to see how it can be used. Uh, I always like to go to the setup or the operations menu, add milling operation, and then you can go to 3D HSM. So let's take a look at the first toolpath here, which is horizontal machining. So Horizontal machining is just one of the many options in this list. And with horizontal machining, what you're actually doing is you're looking at the target. So in the geometry section, you can see that it pre-selected the target for me. But of course, I could always click on the new geometry button and then select my own solid. Uh, really, the only time I would ever do that is if I'm including not just the target solid, but something else. Uh, on our YouTube channel, there is a tips and tricks video where I show how to uh, account for the fact that there might be holes in your solid that you don't want to machine at this time. So in that case, I create a surface on top of the solid, and then when I go back into the HSM toolpath, I'll select the surface and my original solid and get a model that says something like model. Um, so that's really the only time I would choose a new geometry. But on a general sense, when you're using HSM and some of the other 3D toolpaths in this introductory series, you're gonna use target because again, that is one solid that you're using to define all your operations. So if you have to make a single change, it filters through all those operations. Under tool, HSM is uh, predominantly a finishing toolpath. So you're gonna use things like flat end mills, bull end mills, ball end mills. Uh, there are other toolpaths in here that can use the different shapes of tools, but mainly it's gonna be those three basic tools. Constraint boundaries allows us to control where the tool is gonna to travel along the target. So in this case, we're looking at a large solid, but we might not wanna do the entire solid with a single tool. We can use the constraint boundary to limit the travel of the tool to certain areas. For more on how this one section works, I would refer you to our YouTube channel where there is a playlist called HSM Boundary Type where I go through each one of these options here. Past this section is where you see the main parameters of your HSM toolpath. Now again, there are many technologies in the HSM toolpath. So this section will look a little different for each one of those technologies. So this is actually where we're gonna spend the most of our time in this video series here. Uh, we'll start with the horizontal machining and how to program for that. So being a finishing toolpath, I'm gonna to set my wall offset, my floor offset to zero. If I'm working on a part file that has been translated from a third party format, like an IGES file or a step file, then the surface quality might be a little off. It might not be 100%, I might get a bad looking toolpath just because I'm trying to stay true to that translated file. Uh, so in that case, we have cut tolerance. This allows me to analyze those surfaces either a little more finely or a little more coarsely, depending on the quality of the surface, and that way I can, I can refine uh, the quality of my toolpath. Minimum offset, we're controlling essentially the, staple, the step over, but this being horizontal machining, I'm only controlling just the step over radially. Um, and you can see that I have a min and a max. And this accounts for the fact that I might not be using a tool that has an entirely flat bottom. Maybe I wanna do only a minimum step over for my type of tool and a maximum step over for the, for the maximum cutting surface that I have on my tool. So this gives me the ability to kind of control the radial step over with a min and a max. Smoothing, if I turn this on and off, that lower uh, left corner graphic shows us basically what that's doing. You can see that if I have a series of lines that make up that corner, 
as soon as I turn, turn on smoothing, you can see that it turns it into an arc. So smoothing just finds those really jaggedy edges and turns it into a nice smooth arc. And that should, again, further refine the operation, further refine the toolpath so that it's a little easier to machine the part. The tech core areas, we're looking at a solid here and I'm telling it to apply these rules to the solid as a whole. I'm actually gonna give it this additional rule of if it can do a side entry, it will do a side entry rather than doing a ramp into a cavity. So it's really just looking for those areas where it can actually do somewhat of a side entry. Refine corners, again, for the refining the toolpath. So if we are doing any kind of 90 degree turn and I'd rather not do that, I can turn on refine corners and give everything a corner rad. On the right side, point reduction, again, more ability to refine the toolpath. So if the chain geometry, the toolpath itself, um, is a little er erratic, and I'd like to smooth out the movement of that tool, if you look at the wire frame of the toolpath and it looks a little erratic, you can reduce the number of data points or even increase the number of data points if you want to take a closer look at your part. And again, you can further dial this toolpath in by just reducing or increasing the number of data points. It's on the top right corner here that we're actually going to see some effective uh, parameters here, and that is the limits in the Z direction. So in constraint boundaries, we told it where it's limited in, in terms of travel in the XY plane. Here, we're telling it how much of the solid and how much movement of the tool is allowed in the Z direction. So if we set it by target, you can see that it gave me the, the Z top and the Z bottom of my target. I set it by stock, it'll look at the Z top and Z bottom of my stock definition. Um, now that is just an automatic feature, but if I want to say, for instance, here in this particular one, horizontal machining, I don't want to go past this bottom face here because that is the last horizontal face on this part. And past that point, I know there are no other horizontal faces. There really is no need in analyzing the target past that point. So I could set Z bottom to that point, and then it won't even bother trying to do any horizontal machining past that point. This is a finishing toolpath. So I don't need it to do anything over here because I'll be finishing that with a completely different operation or a completely different strategy inside of HSM. So talking about smoothing, in the smoothing tab, you actually have the ability to refine the parameters of how to smooth out those corners. So you have maximum radius, and then you have some tolerances for those lines that you're analyzing. Under axial offset, you can turn this horizontal machining toolpath into a semi-finishing and giving it some additional passes here. If you turn on axial offset, you can give it a number of passes. You can tell what that the distance between those passes are. So this is a way of just kind of doing a little bit of a semi-finishing with the horizontal machining toolpath. Under edit passes, what we're doing here is we're turning this 3D toolpath into a stock recognition toolpath. So there's a little bit of a difference here. Once you choose HSM, it is looking at the target solid to see where the faces are you'd like to machine, but it's not really taking into account if there's any material there to be removed. Now, if we already finished, let's say this face here and this face here, but we didn't even bother to do these ones yet, then if I turn this on and edit the toolpath based off of the updated stock, it'll actually see that there is material on these faces, but not these faces, and it'll remove or trim the toolpath so it doesn't even bother doing the areas where there is no material. So this right here turns this into a stock recognition toolpath, recognizing the updated stock. It, uh, this toolpath is already doing its own gouge checking against the target model, but if I want to add some additional ability here to do some gouge checking, I can tell it to look at the vise as well, and it'll trim the toolpath so it avoids gouging any additional solids that I've defined in this CAMPART file. So this one section here allows you to kind of trim the toolpath to further dial it in. Under the link, now going back to kind of more general settings inside of HSM, under link section, this is where you control the movement of the tool around the part. So in this case, climb milling versus conventional, or we could just set it to bi-directional. If there are instances where we need to link the toolpath in certain ways or adjust how it moves, we have all the options over here, starting points and uh, adjusting clearance levels and such. So what you're really doing here is, again, this is sort of an automatic toolpath. So this section alone gives you the ability to kind of take further control over those automatic settings. Under ramping, I mentioned before that if it can ramp a certain way into a pocket, it will. Here's where you tell it what that ramping should be. Uh, so profile ramping, helical ramping, or plunge ramping. And as soon as we check on one of the other options, it opens up the parameters for that. So for instance, if I wanted to do helical ramping, I get options for helical ramping. If I want to do profile, 
I get the profile options there as well. So this is really just controlling how it enters into the part. Strategy, read tracks, and leads. Each one of these has a similar function of just further refining the different aspects of this HSM. A lot of the times the default will do you uh, what you need, um, but if you have some specific ways you'd like to retract around the part, uh, for instance, if you generate the toolpath and it looks like it's moving a lot into the clearance level, then you can change how your retractions work. Uh, but the past the section is where I'd like to spend most of the time in this video. So right now, let's take a look at the horizontal machining toolpath in terms of wireframe. So from the entire solid, it recognized just those areas there, the tops of these bosses and those flat areas there. So what you'll see is that it generates the minimum and the maximum offsets. It is moving around just on those flat areas there. So from that entire solid, it finishes that right there. If we go to the next one. This one is essentially the opposite. It is the constant Z machining. So this is every face that is not horizontal. So this is tapered faces, this is curved faces, everything there. But you'll see the workflow is the same. We're looking at the target, we're choosing whatever tool we like, we're using constraint boundaries in a similar manner. Under link, everything here is the same. Uh, it's just the passive section that is different. In this case, again, this is a finishing tool pass. We're doing wall offset of zero, floor offset of zero, cut tolerance. This time though, this one is only for vertical faces. So now we only have a step down that we control. We can detect flat areas if need be, and we can do some smoothing if we need as well. Uh, so all really doing, we're really doing here is just machining all the faces that the horizontal machining did not do. Um, you can see that the limits in Z are the same, but now we have this additional angle option here as well. So we can limit the travel of the tool, or at least limit the recognition of the tool by the angle of the face. So if we're looking at some of these faces and some of them are purely vertical, I might not want to even bother with purely vertical because I can do that with a profile operation or maybe another tool path in here completely. So this particular option with this particular tool, I don't want to waste it on purely vertical faces. Maybe I can just do it on just the curves and the tapers. So this is kind of an angle uh, filter that allows me to make sure I only uh, address the faces that are appropriate for this tool path. We covered smoothing in the previous one, so it's very much the same. Adaptive step down, because we're moving in the Z direction and we're giving it a step down, there might be certain features on this part that fall in between that step. So in this case, we're doing a 10th thou step. There might be some, some fillets in here, or maybe there are some flats in here um, that are falling in between that 10th thou step, or whatever the step I've defined. In this case, I can actually get it to inc uh, insert additional passes that fall in between those steps. So let's say instead of a 10 thou uh, flat or 10 thou uh, increment on these walls, uh, I wanted to take a look and maybe add this, uh, you know, add a little bit of a precision here so I can get a better scalloping on that face. I can insert some passes and get it to clean up that face a little bit more before we move on. Edit passes, very similar to what we saw before. If I do not have any material on those faces, I can get it to look at the updated stock and then not even bother with machining that face. So you can always turn that on to further uh, reduce the cycle time, or reduce the work that this toolpath is doing just by looking at the updated stock. In this case, let's continue through here, but maybe just clicking on the wireframe. So this is your HSM linear. And what we're doing here is we're choosing a direction for the tool to follow across the entire surface. So here again, in my constraint boundaries, I'm still selecting the entire solid. So I'm actually trying to apply a linear toolpath to the entire solid. And if your tool, uh, if your part has a direction to it, this is a very useful toolpath to use. Uh, you'll see in some instances, this is not really the best one because as we're trying to go across in this direction, uh, I might not like these movements here. This is not really leaving me a good finish on there. On these areas, definitely this is a nice finish because it follows that contour. If we open this guy up and take a look at the passes section of this one, we're really gonna see the same stuff. In this case, we're gonna get a step over. Um, with the idea that uh, with linear, uh, we're using maybe a ball end mill, and we wanna control the scallop. You can see there's a scallop control there as well. Um, if there's a need for a step down, we can add a little bit of a step down there as well. So we can actually do some semi-finishing with this. Uh, but I wanted to draw the attention to this section here. So again, 
we can tell it which direction we'd like to move in the linear direction by just t telling it a angle off of the x axis, x positive axis. Um, so either by an angle or we can choose two lines or two points to define a line and then that will give us an angle from the x axis as well. So this is really just the direction that we're moving across the part and we also have angle limits here as well. So if we didn't want to uh, um, bother with Doing, horizontal, uh, doing linear movements on certain faces, we can ignore those as well. Uh, the only thing here that's a little different as we go through the tabs, again, edit passes, and there's an axial offset here as well, is the cross. So if you take a look at this, this would actually leave not that really the best finish. So there is a way to go in the opposite direction, the perpendicular direction, just by telling it to repeat the toolpath, but in the different direction. So you can get that cross pattern. You can get a better finish, with just repeating the toolpath going in the opposite direction. And then from there, it is actually getting a little simpler because now we're just telling it how we'd like to move across the part depending on uh, constraint boundaries and such. So in this case, let's look at the radial machining. This one's including a working area, or in this case, a boundary type, that is only for this dish. Let's open this guy up and we can take a look at the parameters of that one. So in the passive section, this being a radial machining, which is very much of a, just a sta uh, star pattern or a spoke kind of pattern, uh, what we're doing is, again, we're giving it a step over. So this is a step over across the surface. We're defining the center, the minimum, and the maximum radius of the feature looking to machine. So in this case, I have the minimum radius, maximum radius. I've got the center that I've defined using a sketch. Uh, and then we have the angle control here as well. So all we're really doing here again is just telling it to go in a star pattern, radial pattern, based off the geometry in this particular area. This is very much like the other toolpath, something that you might only want to apply to a certain area. So that's where the boundary type will come in handy. I can tell it to only work within that chain there. And I've only chained that, uh, that dome shape uh, where I'd like it to, to machine. So once you get past some of the features like horizontal and constant Z, you'll find that a lot of these are very specific to an area. So let's say, for instance, the spiral machining toolpath. I would not want to apply this to the entire part because it wouldn't really make sense. There really is no spiral nature to the entire solid. But to this specific area, looks like I can really use this to clean this up nicely with a nice concentric toolpath. And then as it goes along here, I'm just really just maintaining a spiral in this point of view here. So from the top view, that is spiraling around a central point. And if we open that up to look at the parameters, we'll see that again, it's very simple. We're gonna give it a constraint boundary. So defined by that sketch circle that I've, I've hidden. And if we go to passes, again, we have a center, a minimum and a maximum radius. So I'm really, again, just telling it how I'd like to travel around the part, but limiting the travel tool here so that it actually generates something that would look appropriate for this particular feature. If we look at morphed machining, what we'll see here is something that actually is not only driven by the solid, so you can see I chose inside the passes section here. We'll take a look at my constraint area. So in terms of constraint boundary, I just want to do just inside that area, just the outside edges of that surface. But there's now a new section called drive boundaries. And with morphed machining, what we're actually doing is we're morphing the toolpath or blending the toolpath from one contour, in this case, that edge of the solid right there, blending it to this edge right here. You can see that this guy has a little bit of an arc there and then it kind of tapers in. You can see that represented in the wireframe. So it starts parallel to that one side and then it begins to get a little bit of a kink there until it matches parallel to that other side. So morph machining allows you to tell it to look at the solid but blend the toolpath across that area. And if we look at passes, again, very basic. We have a step over across that surface. We have some recognition and some limitations here, but all the other functions are the same. So with morph machining, it's more to do with the dry boundaries and telling it how we'd like to morph the toolpath across there. And of course we have cross and along. So I'm doing it as an along, I'm following that parallel, but I can always do perpendicular to that as well using the across section.
Let's take a look at the next one here. So the offset cutting. And again, this one has a drive boundary as well. If take a look at the drive boundary here. It is just that edge of the solid there. What I'm actually doing with this is I'm telling it to go to the right side of that chain. So I'm going to go towards this direction. I'm constraining it. I'm not really constraining it to the entire solid. I'm looking at it. I'm looking at the entire solid, but because this is a offset cutting, I'm actually just telling it that there's a certain amount of material away from that, that arc or that, that chain that I like to machine, and I like to step over across that area um, uh, using this value here. And what that generates is a toolpath that looks like this. Again, it is looking only at the solid for the movements of the tool, but it's starting from that chain and moving in a, uh, a parallel distance. So because that chain tends to arc a little bit over here, we're seeing this kind of pulling in of the tool along there. And what that actually allows me to do is just finish that one area. There's a certain amount of material I want to machine with a certain step over. I just get it to clean that up a little bit there. So that really just kind of gives me a little bit of a cleanup. And because we're following one direction, now we have a cross section as well. We can actually tell it to go not only along that chain, but I can flip this if I say add uh, the cross after, I can get it to kind of go in a perpendicular direction to clean that up as well. HSM boundary is more of just a projection of a toolpath. So let's take a look at this from a perpendicular view. This can be useful if you've got some sort of engraving that you want to do onto a solid rather than some surfaces. Uh, and what we're really doing here is we open this guy back up. There is a chain or a sketch that I have hidden that I've used as my drive boundary. It's really just a circle that I've projected on the top or I've, I've sketched on the top of the part. And you can see that it projects that circle onto my solid. So whatever shape my solid takes, I'm actually projecting that circle on there. So this can be useful for uh, some kind of unique trimming. If you're looking to do any kind of trimming, if you're doing engraving on a solid, uh, there are many applications for the uh, the boundary machining. Uh, and because of just how simple it is in just terms of projection, there really isn't much in the passive section. There is the wall offset, the top, the bottom. There really is no control over the movement of the tool because that is all driven by the drive boundary. Now, with every... 3D toolpath, there is always a rest option because you're going to choose a certain tool to do those 3D toolpaths, but that tool might be too large to do certain areas. Um, so what we get is the rest machining option to allow it to recognize that a previous tool has already acted on the part, and now we want to do some remaining uh, stock removal with a smaller diameter tool. So let's go through this one in a little more detail. So we're still looking at the target as geometry. We've chosen the tool we'd like to use in this operation. Constraint boundaries, we're telling it to look at the entire solid, but again, if you're doing rest machining, you might not want to do the entire part. So this is where the constraint boundary section can help out a little bit more because now I might not want to do uh, a lot of machining with this small tool over the entire part. I might want to just do it in a certain area. Now the reference tool is the previous tool that was used. Now this is assuming that we'd like to um, to reference a ball end mill, uh, but in uh, in production now we're actually looking at using different tools. But currently you can only reference a ball end mill that was used previously to machine the part. Uh, and what this will actually tell it to do is look at how this part would have been done with this size of tool, and now with a smaller diameter tool we can actually machine what was left over. And in the passive section, that's what we're actually doing here. We have parameters in here, again, very similar to what we saw before. Wall offset, floor offset, the top, the bottom, point reduction. But what we're doing with these lower sections is taking a little more of an analysis as to what the previous part could have done. So now that we have a smaller ball mill, we're looking to only work in the tight areas that was left behind by the previous tool. So by tangency angle is essentially the angle made by the tangent points of the ball with each corner surface. So the, that tangency right there, that tangency right there, what angle that makes. And that allows you to control what is actually a tight corner that this toolpath is going to focus on. Uh, and because this is a multi-directional tool, we have a step down and a step over. Steep threshold, you have control over 
how, how, how steep you would like to go with this toolpath. The shallow areas, you can tell it what we'd like to do in the shallow areas. So as I toggle through this, you can actually see how it addresses some of those areas there. And then just the, if I can get my mouse in there, the stroke ordering, you can just see how it recognizes the, uh, the different features on the part and how it'll move around. And then of course, this being a rest machining operation, it already is looking at what material is left behind that you can machine just by the reference tool. So what that previous tool did not do, what this tool can do. But even more powerful is the edit section here where we can actually tell it to look at the updated stock. So not only are we trying to analyze what the previous tool left behind, we're also analyzing what is in the stock and what needs to be, what was already left behind uh, by other toolpaths. Maybe not simply just one reference tool, but the rest of the tools, rest of operations, what is left behind. So again, this section works the same as previous, but it takes on a little bit more of a power here because we're actually looking to machine only what was left behind. Let's exit out of that one. We'll take a look at one of the more powerful HSM technologies, and that is the 3D constant step over. So 3D constant step over is the kind of toolpath that you would use if you're not sure what direction you like to go around your part or if you're looking for a specific finish on your on your solid. So let's start from the beginning here. So it's still using the target as our geometry. We're choosing whatever tool we'd like. In this case, I'm using a ball end mill. Constraint boundaries, I'm limiting the travel of the tool to let's say only within that circle there. So in this case, I'm using just the constraint boundary to limit the travel of the tool, but you could do this toolpath through the entire part. The drive boundary is what we're offsetting from. So we can reference that. It's really just the same circle. So I'm looking to get that nice circular pattern on our part. Now, if we go to passes, again, wall offset, floor offset, Z top, Z bottom. We have some angle limitations here as well, point reduction. It's this section here that's a little different. In this case, we have a horizontal step over and a vertical step over. And the reason they're referred to like that is because we are essentially projecting this constant step over toolpath onto our part. If we take a look at the wireframe, we're offsetting from that circle and going from outside, from inside out. So it might look like a spiral, but actually what we're doing is we're offsetting from that drive boundary by these values here. If we look at this from the top view, it should look like just a simple circular toolpath offset from that circle working its way outwards. If we rotate this around, you can see that it, it is almost like it is just draping a offset toolpath onto our part. And of course, we have the same functionality here of edit passes and axial offset. Now that is how you would actually really tailor this guy in. You would choose constraint boundaries, you would choose drive boundaries, but let's say if you just did it by default. So this is using the outside edges of our target. So this is going to be a rectangular looking toolpath. And you can see that it actually is starting from the inside going out. And it's doing almost like a rectangular toolpath. You can see as it gets closer to the edges there, it is just doing those, those corners. And that's because it is trying to offset with that, uh, that uh, 20 thou that we, we gave it as an offset. And it does eventually work towards just a center area there. Um, so this will definitely leave a good finish because you can see it moves in all different directions. So it actually is cleaning up in areas that normally a simple linear or a simple horizontal would not do. Uh, but it is the longer of the toolpaths because of all those different movements there. So this is the type of toolpath I would use if I'm not sure what angle I'd like to go at or what geometry or technology I'd like to use. But the drawback is it's a, it's a very large toolpath. So that's why it actually benefits from having that drive boundary. You can actually tell it specifically where you like to machine the part. Parallel pencil milling uh, is the idea that maybe there are lots of little nooks and crannies, little corner rads, little tight areas on your part that you like to address specifically with just a very small diameter tool. So let's take a look at that in terms of the operation manager. So there actually are um, couple of, there's pencil milling and then there's parallel pencil milling. And the reason there's only one on here is because pencil milling is really just, it'll take the tool, 
find that bitangency angle we talked about before, and then just do a single pass down there. With parallel pencil milling, you get what we see on screen right now. We actually give it the ability to give it some offset there, so it actually can feather in that area. So let's take a look at this again. So target is our geometry. I'm looking to use a 1 8 ball end mill. Uh, and I'm looking at the entire solid, but again, you can use the boundary type to limit the travel of the tool. Maybe there isn't um, corners in certain parts of your, of your file, so you don't want to bother analyzing the entire solid for areas that do not have uh, corner wrap. So you have the ability to kind of limit the travel there. Pencil passes. These are the parameters on what is a pencil pass. So there's our body tangency angle. We can see uh, we can take a look at the um, the if if we imagine it as having an over thickness, so we can t get a better idea of the phi tangency angle. And again, we can also also actually see if there's any material in those corners as well. So we don't have to bother doing uh, pencil milling if there is actually no material in that corner. And then passes passes once we've established what the pencil uh, passes are, what those corners are using the various factors. Now we can just apply how we're going to take care of those. So we have a vertical step over and a horizontal step over, like we had before. Uh, so again, they're referred to as such because we're going to move in all different directions. So really just looking how we're going to move up and across those different areas there. And then uh, if we end up doing a lot of them, we can just limit it to just doing five. And then if we need to, we can actually add some variable steps in there just to kind of clean up the fact that maybe some of the features of these corner rads fall in the, uh, uh, outside of that 10,000 step. The rest of this is the same as what we had before. Z tops to bottom, point reduction, edit passes, axial offset. So this particular toolpath is a very good toolpath for cleaning up those little areas with a very small tool. And then finally in this representation we have here is the 3D corner offset, which is a little different from the 3D corner step over we saw before. Uh, so in this case, again, target geometry tool, constraint boundaries, we're doing the entire part. This one's actually looking at the pencil passes again, so we get a better idea as to where the corners could be, and then we're going to apply some technology to that as well. And all we're really doing here is we're going to generate a large toolpath that incorporates the localization of it. If we kind of look at this from the top view, You can see that it actually doesn't just have one central location, one central kind of node. It actually is looking at the local contours and offsetting from there. So you can see there's a little bit of a uh, kind of a central area there. If we move this around, there's kind of a central area there. So it actually what it does is it looks at those pencil passes, looks at the solid as a whole, or at least what is within that constraint boundary, and it generates a little more of a local kind of um, step over. And again, this one is a rather large toolpath, but uh, in certain instances, you can see that it actually is moving around the part a little more cleaner than if it was just a simple linear or if it was just a, a 3D constant step over. So this one has its features. It's really more to do with the drive boundary or in this case, the pencil passes, uh, but you can get this one to really clean up a part uh, that otherwise would not be um, well done by, uh, by some of the other features. Now, some of the other features that weren't actually represented in this list, let's take a look at those now. So. We have constant Z machining, which we covered. Really, that only covers just the vertical walls, the tapered faces, the curved faces, but there might be a need to do a little bit of a horizontal move. So the hybrid constant Z allows us to do that. Hybrid constant Z, if we switch it to that option, you'll see that it actually, in the passive section, it has a little bit of a step over as well. So this one should take care of a little bit of a horizontal area. It's kind of a hybrid between the two. Uh, but with that in mind, if we jump down to combine, you can actually combine your constant Z machining with any one of the other options there. And then using that angle limit, you can tailor which one does what. So in the instance of constant Z uh, combined with horizontal, you basically can take that one tool and do any vertical faces, any taper faces, in addition to your flat faces. Or if you want to do the flat faces with a linear machining, then using those angle limits, you can tell it that everything between, let's say, 0 and 45 is 1, 45 and 90 is the other one. So whichever one does a better job on the different features, each one of these options here uh, will will tailor to it. So combine constant Z with, and then you have the ability to uh, mate those together. 
Uh, I referred to it as spiral machining, but a little bit of a correction. There is both a spiral and a helical machining. Helical machining uh, will simply just generate a helical toolpath. So uh, helical toolpath is really just a pro uh, progressive Z movement down a part. So this would be best used on a, uh, a solid that has kind of a continuous nature to it. So if I were to do a Z top from here, and a Z bottom that ends at maybe that rad right there, I could do a helical on that, but I would not do a helical on this entire part. So helical is very similar to some of the other toolpaths, it just adds a helical toolpath to the overall part. We are down to prismatic machining. So prismatic machining is, again, a little bit of a hybrid of the uh, constant Z and horizontal. It really just looks at things in a prismatic view. So if we open that guy up, we'll see that in the passive section. Again, it should give us a step down, step over, and it will apply, uh, it'll apply different offsets, different smoothing. Um, generally, the HSM toolpath as a whole, you're looking at using one or all of these options in here. So it's really just a matter of um, what technology best fits your solid, what parameters best fit the, the uh, condition of your part in terms of updated stock, contours available or contours you can add in terms of sketches to better control the movement of the tool across the part. But as a whole, it is a solid based finishing tool path. So if, uh, if you are looking at finishing your part in a certain direction or a combination of such, you can use different constraint boundaries to limit the travel of the tool to different areas, and you can get a good finish on the different areas by just controlling the different movements around the part. Any questions of this or anything else from SolidCam, just give us a call at 1-866-975-1115, extension 2. And stay tuned for the rest of the videos in this intro series. Thanks for watching.